Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Space Game Junkie Podcast. I, as always, am your co-host, Brian, and joining me, as always, is your co-host, Jim. Here I am. Your co-host, <laughs> Hunter. Sorry. That was, <laughs> that was unexpected. Hi, guys. And your co-host, Spaz. Hello. And we have a guest this week, folks, uh, joining us... From Winnipeg, Manitoba, it's, uh, <laughs> okay, just a bit of background. Uh, every week before the, the show, I send a get, I send a Google form to our upcoming guests to, uh, get some information about them. And I ask their name and where they're from and their title. Today's guest, uh, replied to what's your name and your title and all that. Brett, founder of Brain Good Games, I guess. So welcome, Brett. <laughs> Hey, I, I guess I found it very good games. <laughs> I just, I don't know why I find that so hilarious. It's like, uh, you don't know? Are you sure? <laughs> Allegedly? That's what they tell me. <laughs> so you heard. Uh, welcome, yeah. Brett. We're here to talk about your uh, awesome spacey card game. Uh, it's This is a specific type of card game, I think. I just don't. No, then it's like worker placement or something. Worker what placement. Is... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like card game, game, board game. Yeah. Stuff. It's a Space thing. Checkers. Something like that. It's, uh, it's, it's worker placement. Okay, worker placement. Uh, Solar Settlers, which came out uh, a couple months ago, at this point, and uh, you know we're the the schedule for this podcast is filling up, folks. So we're like that's why we're like so. Behind on getting you on the show, I kind of sort of apologize for that, uh, sort of. But uh, welcome, Brett. Thank you for coming. And uh, I just want to say right off the bat, your game is great. Your game you. I is appreciate great. It. I, as Spaz can attest, am not a fan of card games. I know nothing of worker placement games. Uh, I am terrible at card games, actually, as Spaz can also attest, as he keeps beating me in star realms every time <laughs> every time because i'm terrible but your Brother game always beats me at that too <laughs> but your game is awesome so uh for folks who don't know why don't you give uh folks like the elevator pitch slash bulleted list slash rundown of what solar settlers actually is this is a space exploration card game and what that means is basically your given the task of uh, exploring and colonizing a new solar system uh, for mankind to survive in, uh, but you use cards to do that. So you might uh, explore, and, and the cards make up the board, basically. So you start at your uh, homeworld card in the middle of the board, and you kind of expand outwards, and you might explore and find a jungle world or a water world or a rock world or anything like that. And then you can have cards in your hand that you can upgrade those worlds with. So you might build a mining facility on the rock world to mine some ore or something like that. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different cards uh, in the game that do all kinds of different things. And um, uh, a bunch of races too, alien races that you can play as. So it's kind of the opposite of cards against humanity. It's cards for... Oh, cards for humanity, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe cards with humanity. <laughs> cards alongside humanity. Uh, so, so how many alien races are in the game? I've only discovered one so far. How many are there? Is there only one? Are are there more you can unlock? Uh, there's human, and then I believe four more, and I'm working oh, on a fifth man. one this week. Uh, I'm gonna I plan to update really? next week. Now, what are the differences between? I've only unlocked one. Uh, so, what are the differences? Um, yeah. So each of the races uh, have a different homeworld. The humans that you start with have. Uh, a few different homeworlds, I think three, um, that, that randomly get chosen at the beginning of each game. Uh, but each other race after that uh, has their own specific homeworld that has a specific power. So the first race you unlock is called the Formids, and they're kind of like the ant people, um, and they specialize in building huge structures. So uh, their power uh, gives you benefits whenever you play a card on top of another card. So if you build extremely tall tower structures with a whole big stack of cards, uh, then you get a big benefit for that. 
Um, and then also, uh, there are different goals that the game sets up for you while you play. So it'll say like, oh, like you need to get a certain amount of military and then we'll give you this free card. Um, kids have a special set of cards that they use for that. Um, and they also key off of building big towers, big structures. So I, I've, I don't think I've ever done this. I have about maybe three or four hours in the game, but I don't think I've ever done this because I mostly play a human so far. I only yeah. started playing the first unlockable alien like yesterday. Cool. <laughs> but but um so what does that mean like because i know that there are cards you can do to upgrade a world but can you like yeah. stack a card on top of that card to make an even taller stack as it were yeah oh exactly and the, and the formats have cards that care about that so it'll say like if you have a stack of three or more you can play this card on top of it because it's like the oh. top of a tower or, or whatever like that um whereas the, none of the human cards care about stack height at all that explains why I never really paid much attention to it until I noticed it on the form and stuff. Like, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, each, 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 each of the alien races, the idea of them is that they do something that the other ones all don't do or, or make you play in, in a different way or, or whatever. Just kind of change up the game to give it some new legs if you get bored of the, you know, standard humans. Right, so there, are, so, so the, are there specific race cards as well that you only can play... Uh, when you're playing that race? Yeah. Uh, the the base pool or deck, um, your uh, your player cards, the cards that you draw into your hand, are the same for each race. But the goal cards that you gain from completing objectives are different for each race. Um, oh. And it, it does tend to substantially change the way you play with each race. Like, a good human strategy is not at all the same as a good format strategy. You'll lose doing that. In fact, you will. <laughs> yes. And I have because <laughs> there's been so many times where because uh, there are um, multiple things you have to juggle. There's the uh, the new there's a there's a resource that lets you move and a resource that lets you build and a resource that lets you breathe. So I guess that's what nuclear power, oxygen and metal. Is that right? Something like hydrogen, that? oxygen and metal. Yeah. OK. Hydrogen. Excuse me. And. You wouldn't believe how many times I ran out of hydrogen. So there'd be turns go by where I couldn't <laughs> move. And it's like, yeah, I lost. <laughs> I I just lost. Awkward quickly. It's like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> I think I may have doomed humanity. And then you just end up kind of hitting end turn. Like, this could have gone so much better. <laughs> and, and But there are games where I've gotten just enough uh, hydrogen where I've been able to pull out a win in like the last turn. Which is really nice. It's really satisfying. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so that is one thing about this game is that, uh, I, like I said, I, I'm not really big into card games like this, but something about this game is just so satisfying. It, it plays really fast, which is really nice. And there's just so much variation, which is also really nice. Yeah. Is I, I know you have other games like this. So are, do, are are your other card games? Because I, I this is the only game of yours I've played. So are your other games similar? Like there's random cards and random boards, random card placement on the board. Yeah. Are there, uh, there's. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. So each of the five games from Ranger Games has kind of a different level of variability. I, I would say this Solar Settlers probably has the most out of any of them, just because. With the there's a pretty big card pool and the cards are all pretty substantially different and then also you have the five races just in case that wasn't enough variability for you um but yeah my my game that i made just before this is called minus strategos um and it also has cards so it has a pretty big card pool too um because gen i come from a board game background uh generally my, my favorite games are all board games um a lot of my favorite games among those are the games that have the highest variability in between games uh that you play like I, I i always like it when a game provides me brand new situations to grapple with uh each time um because i like trying out different things and kind of seeing if it works and playing by feel um getting things out um really mapping out my strategy over the course of many games um i i, I prefer to play by the from the hip uh, so th uh, I suppose that kind of bleeds into the games that I make. It shows. It it really does. It really does. 
it, it really, really does. Uh, so th- you said this is your fifth game, uh, right? Yep. So tell folks about, and me, I guess, too, about the other games you've made. Sure. So a couple of years ago, I started Brand New Games. Uh, I got laid off from my job at a uh, video game dev company uh, in Winnipeg, where I live. Um, and I decided, hey, like, I could go try to get another job right away, or I could take a few months and just try to make something and release it and see if I could pay the bills with that. <laughs> um, so I made Militia, which was the first game, which is kind of like a very minimalist uh, um, chess-like uh, abstract strategy game where you fight with, uh, you have a, a, a group of scrappy adventures like a paladin or a or whatever, um, and you have different combinations that you roll each game. So you have a, a group of three of them, and you kind of have to solve hordes of orcs and archers and dwarves and all this kind of stuff, and clear the board uh, to advance kind of thing. So that's what Militia is all about. It's kind of like, it's they're all single-player strategy games. Right. Yeah, so that one's uh, about... Uh, it's kind of like a chess-like, movement patterny, abstract strategy game. Okay. Um, yeah, and then so the second game is called Axes and Acres, um, and that game is uh, uh, like a farming um, strategy game. So right. you're building up like a little settlement of castles and wish- wells and uh, uh, farms and this kind of thing, and you have and you roll dice, uh, and the dice represent your workers. So you might roll a bunch a set of worker dice. Some of them will say that you can do work, or you can build structures, or you can reproduce to make new dice or whatever. And you have to, from that pool of dice that you've drawn, kind of decide what you want to do each turn with the dice that you've rolled. Um, oh, see, I actually own that one already. I had no idea you made it. So, um, but it, it kind of put me in mind, and and maybe not at all inspired by, but Agricola. Absolutely, um, it was inspired by that. Agricola. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, especially awesome. uh, kind it's of like aesthetically. Yeah, like it's the the especially like the color scheme and kind of like the theming is almost directly from Agricola, like that kind of quaint uh, farming. I don't know. Ran with it for the second game. Yeah, the um, uh, the Aces and Acres game is the uh, the first one I had heard of, and I know um, on a couple forums I'm on, people love that game, like love yeah. that game. Aces and Acres is like a very divisive kind of taste. I find uh, the people that uh, really like it and kind of get into it seem to like it a lot. Um, on top of it. Um, but for the people that have gotten into it, like there's a lot of meat and depth and strategy available there. Uh, They're probably like some already of the players that have played it the most. I'd say. Most part, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's people that are, have like several hundred hours in the game and stuff. So like, it, it, there's a lot to chew on um, in that one for sure. So so. Um... Have have has there been anything that you've learned along the way that you, like you've made each game a little different or maybe a little better or maybe a little ver- more varied, like so many things. <laughs> well, what, I, I, I'm curious. Like, what have you learned along the way? Because these games sound like they're all based on they're they're all very board gamey and yet they're they're different each of them, which is really nice. I'm probably gonna get them now. Uh, the one I really want is Skyboats. That's the one I'm I'm very. Uh, that's yours too, right? I I saw that. They think on Steam that that's also yours. Yep, and I just actually did a big rework of Skyboats uh, just recently. Uh, I was kind of unhappy with how it was playing and going like going back on it, going back to it, and I so I I don't know. <laughs> probably like it's probably not a financially prudent decision, <laughs> but I spent like a a whole whack of development time just kind of like overhaul um and now it's in a place where i'm super happy with the way it plays so yeah by all means i'd, I'd love to hear what you think of it now i'm gonna put that in my cart right now got bananas, i can't explain that but there's bananas there are yeah yeah the theming is 
strange. <laughs> so what what would you say what what would you say are some of the big lessons you've learned along the way as you've made these uh these varied games? So the big lesson that I learned from well, Militia, mostly the lessons that I learned were about production and just about releasing games and how Steam works and how people respond to different things and all kind of, like just the very basics of like releasing a product. Um, and then I learned, I, yeah, I probably learned more from that than any other one, um, but just because it was my first game. And then Axes and Acres responding well to the depth of the game and the strategy and the replay value and that kind of thing. Um, but the people had, there were definitely issues with people getting into the game as far as like playing through the tutorial, not understanding and still not understanding how the game worked or even having trouble getting through the tutorial. Um, so it, it, it took a big step up in complexity for Militia. And I kind of thought that I'd be able to, um, but I had issues with that for sure. Um, and since we've gone back and access and acres tutorial, how hey. people kind of report that it's a lot easier. Hey man, one um, second. Uh, you keep cutting out like the first few words of uh, when oh. you talk. So hang on, I'm going to um, switch servers. One second. Sure. And we're back. Uh, that hopefully will be better. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, it should have blinked you out and then back. Yeah. It just was like the first couple words whenever you'd start talking would cut out, which was kind of weird. I apologize, sure. folks. That's one oh, of the problems. Uh, what... Huh? Well, he's also not on push to talk, so it might be something to do with that. Maybe. Yeah, because it's until it detects that you're loud enough to trigger the mic. Sometimes. Oh. Are you like yep. lean, are you like leaning back from the mic? Because this wasn't happening earlier. It's kind of weird. Um, Hopefully it stops. Yeah, I hope so too. So slow rider. Sorry, like, sorry, folks. Uh, this is this is what happens when you do it live. Um, so it looks like so far the response to uh, Solar Settlers, excuse me, has been really positive. Like just about everyone I know who's played it has really enjoyed it. Well, I think that's a big result. Uh, result of the learning that I've done over the five games. Like each game kind of has a whole bunch of lessons that I've brought forward. Um, for example, for Solar Settlers, I was trying a whole bunch of new things in terms of like the meta game. So like now there's like cards that you unlock with experience points and a whole bunch of leaderboards um, and a weekly challenge mode um, and, and, and the five alien races that you can unlock. So there's a whole bunch more uh, outside of the match itself um, in Solar Settlers than the previous brink of games have had. So for your next game, well, I would I would suggest uh, a card-based version of Space Station 13. Let's mention that to me the other day, actually. That's, that's funny you should say that. What is, what is <laughs> yeah, that? Yeah, we'll see, we'll see in about 10 years when we get that done. What is that? Well, yeah. Space... I hadn't heard about oh, it Oh, really? You have... Okay, for... Space Station 13 is one of the... Well, just two days it's, ago. It's like... Yeah. Uh, it's a it's a crappy game to look at, and it's difficult to play because the interface is is cumbersome and gnarly. Uh, it, it's it's kind of like a multiplayer dwarf fortress in space sort of thing, being like that it's a story generator, because just everybody comes out of that thing with some ludicrous story about stuff that went on. If you if you just go on YouTube and search for SS thirteen story, yeah. And, you know, they, they, there's people that have done, like, cartoons that animate out, you know, <laughs> what all happened. And, yeah, it, it's just, uh, I keep waiting. Keep waiting on somebody to remake that thing in a, in a, a way that I can tolerate. Because it uses, what is, what is that client that it uses, Spaz? It's uh, something nasty. I'm actually not sure. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember what the client is, but it's a, it, it's like a platform for multiplayer like uh tile based rpg games right uh, but it's uh, <laughs> your dog's ringing the bell oh, yeah she's eating i'm sorry <laughs> that's the hazards of using a condenser microphone because you could hear like a gnat fart across the house picks up everything <laughs> 
And the bigger the room you're in, the worse it is. Seriously. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Yeah, some odd technical hiccups uh, this evening. So, uh, yeah, uh, the one thing I really like about uh, Solar Settlers is how fast it plays. I think my longest game was 10 or 15 minutes, if that. I, how about much, what I'm shooting for, yeah. Yeah, how much uh, work went into making it so efficient and elegant? It's just kind of a result of my, I don't know, design sense or whatever you would say. Like, uh, I'm pretty the game that can deliver uh, an interesting experience in a short amount of time because I really like playing games over and over and over and kind of like getting to know them slowly, especially when there's a huge variety of content and stuff. Um, if you sit down and play a game that takes two hours, it can take a really long time to get anywhere in terms of learning it. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I just am pretty ruthless right from the beginning of the design process in terms of making sure that things stay pretty lean and mean. Um, so so how do you design something like this? Do you have a flow chart? I mean, it's it's so just... It has a rhythm to it, you know, that... that that I'm not used to in, uh, in playing games. And so how do you, how do you build that? A lot of inspiration from board games, like I said. So if it's a kind of a mechanical basis for an idea, um, a lot of times it'll come from a board game um, or kind of a combination of two or three board games together. Um, and that'll kind of form the basis. Um, and then I'll kind of start whittling away, cutting away things I don't like, adding things I do like. Or a lot of board games are multiplayer, obviously. So translating a game from a multiplayer board game into a single-player video game, I mean, a lot is going to change just right there. Um, I think there's a second part of your question, but I'm not quite sure what it was. <laughs> uh, no, I was just wondering, like, how do you map out this kind of gameplay? Like, like, how do you, is it, like I said, is it like some kind of flow chart, some kind of Bible? Like, wh what do you do to make it, to to not only keep track of, because there's so much happening in one turn. There's, there, I mean, it's it looks simple, folks, but it's not. There's so much going on here. <laughs> how how do you create? Like, how do you make that flow happen? Is what is my, is my question. Normally, the fundamental mechanics of the game our basis of it uh, comes all at once. Um, like these, it's kind of like the combination of two ideas or, or whatever. And it's like, oh, it would be really good if you had the cards were the board and you could play building upgrades on top of different types of worlds in the solar system. That's kind of like the seed of the solar settlers idea. And then development, um, well, normally I make a, a paper prototype after that. So before I start coding and spend a lot of development time, I normally make a paper prototype and try some things out. All, um, and then for a lot of the development process, um, for Solar Settlers, there's a lot of cards that had to be designed, right? So there's there's lots of different ways the cards can be designed. Um, each card could either it can either come from like oh like we need a a world that allows you to get metal at a good rate or something or you or it's like oh like what would it be like if there was a incubation pod like from science fiction like what would that look like in this game or like uh something like that or like a wormhole like what does a wormhole mean in solar settlers so like more of a thematic basis um and then also dell spreadsheet of like cards and numbers to kind of keep the deck balanced um because i think people kind of whether subconsciously or consciously expect the deck to have like a certain number of rock worlds and a certain number of water worlds and such. And if it was like wildly unbalanced, it would feel really strange. Um, kinds of different attribute card attributes to make sure that that kind of stays in line. And then kind of the name of the company brain Good games comes from three times during the course of each game that I design each project, I'll have like, 
an epiphany in the shower or like on a walk or something. And I call those brain goods. And so then <laughs> the result of that is brain good games. No, yeah. I mean, have you ever, uh, side note, have you ever read the subreddit Shower Thoughts? Because it's very. Yeah, yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. It's yeah. Super Some entertaining. Of those are really good. Super entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Especially like. Yeah, man. Like, f- folks, there's a video of Nick Offerman from Parks and Recreation reading uh, various uh, posts from Shower Thoughts. It is one of the funniest things. That's <laughs> you know, awesome, yeah. Oh, my God. It's 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 so great. But, yeah, well, I mean, one thing I, I love about the game is that, like, like, the sectors can be different sizes and you might not be able to explore every sector right away. Like, there's so much variation that every 15-minute experience feels fresh. Which awesome. is that's exactly what I'm shooting for. Which, but that's that's usually reserved for like roguelikes, and even they, even roguelikes don't always get that right, you know, in mm-hmm. terms of making each playthrough feel uh, fresh and uh, different. And it's it's great because like I noticed when I was er- playing uh, early games and barely knowing what I was doing and flailing around, like it looked like you were giving. Um, and I'd like to ask about this. You were giving the player all the tools they needed basically to do what they needed to win. It's just where they place their workers and how they use them was the difference between winning and failing. So how does the game generate the cards it needs to give players a chance to win? Well, mostly I leave that up to the random number generator. Um, and then I, but I make sure that there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of get yourself out of sticky situations through clever play. So like they're like on the water world, on the default water world, for example, you can draw cards. So if you've kind of found yourself in a place where you don't exactly have what you need or or you're not the the cards you have don't mesh with the kind of strategy you want to go for, then you can kind of wiggle your way out that way. Um, and that's just one example. There's like the like there's different ways there's different ways to get everything in the game. Um, but it just depends on like how much you're willing to spend and how inefficient you're willing to be. And then the the real skill of the game comes in kind of being more efficient over time. Uh, all the brain good games have a single player ladder system. So it's kind of like if you're playing StarCraft or League of Legends or or whatever other MMR game, um Halo or whatever else, uh where as you win, it'll match you up with harder and harder opponents and as you lose, it'll uh, match you with easier opponents so that each game is kind of right around your the right skill level for you. Um, so all the Brinket games also have that. So as you win, you rank up and the game becomes harder. And as you lose, it gets easier. So that's also a way that I can make sure that the game is at an appropriate level of difficulty each time. Now, uh, Aries on YouTube brings up an interesting point. He says the game needs more pew pew, and this is something I didn't even realize. There really isn't any combat at all in this game, is there? Like at no, all? No, it's very much solar settlers. <laughs> yeah, it's but it's it's I, entirely. I heard that yeah. Oh, you've had a request for combat. How would that even fit in here? How? I'm not how? sure, but I, I've thought about having an expansion for that or something. Uh, if I can figure out a good idea for it. The space farmers was already taken. I mean, so. I mean, you have military, but that's just. To give you it's the pretty mi- abstract, yeah. But that I I always saw it as that gives you the might to be able to explore these far off sectors from your yes uh, main. That planet. is what kind of what it represents. Yeah, yeah. No, but it I, could be done as the military could be. You know, there are pirates on this system. In order to to move here, oh, that you have neat. to actually spend some of your military in order to do that. So there would be a cost involved. But it would be worth it because you could get a maybe a stronger planet in the end. Cool idea. I like that. Oh, oh, that'd be crazy if you had pirates that like took over different parts of the board, like maybe destroyed your cards or if and stuff. If they're already seated. I mean, it would be something like you'd have to be able to have enough military to even find that planet to to explore that area. But it would also cost you maybe a couple of points of your military in order to actually move on to it and then settle. That's awesome. Yeah. I like that idea. That sounds like DLC, man. Right there. <laughs> We're giving you yeah, DLC. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, is there any <laughs> uh, DLC planned for this? I haven't done any DLC for any of the games yet. Uh, okay. I've had people starting to ask for it. Uh, 
over time. That's and, great, um, actually. I don't know. I, I, some part of me feels a little strange about it. I don't know. There's something. I, there's something pure about. I'm a little old school, and I, I like it when you can buy a game. Everything. <laughs> right. That and so like early Bringa game. My first Bringa game release was Militia on Android, and it was free to play. But then you could buy the Dark World expansion, and you could pay to remove apps. But it's always made me feel a little uneasy. Anything except for pay up front and you get the whole I've thing. I've got it, dude. So I can loot crate cut... the game. It could be like a card based loot crate game. Yeah. Or... <laughs> you mean like Hearthstone or? <laughs> well, well, kind of. But I mean that that's like the trend in, in everything. Like if you look at like oh absolutely, Unknowns, it's like oh, do you want to spend some real money and then you get to open random lottery crates and see if you get a cool widget. Or what? Oh, it'll, I, it'll I definitely know. work. It just it makes me feel. I, 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 oh, I know. <laughs> I'm I'm just joking. I'm 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 like, if you feel bad about DLC, try putting loot crates in your game and see how you feel. I could imagine making DLC if I had a really good idea. Like maybe like a combat DLC for Solar Settler sounds like the kind of a cool thing. I think it needs to be like a pretty big, substantial chunk. Something or, that people really feels want. Like it changes the game in a major way, and not just something that that gets kind of tacked on to it because you could kind of something tacked on you could just do that as and release it as you know free content update so then and then also something that's like not essential so that people that don't have the dlc don't feel like or or whatever like their their experience isn't full or you know whatever yeah exactly like it's kind of like a new mode or something you know something like that that, that makes sense, and I I like that because uh, the paradox model really only works for paradox, <laughs> and even then, oh my it, God. it doesn't entire. <laughs> even then, it doesn't entirely work, really. Uh, DLC for paradox games on Steam are so funny. Oh my it, God! <laughs> I think I think my favorite is like, I think I saw on a bundle recently or on a weekly sale it was like Europe Europe or Universalis Three complete, but it wasn't complete. It was just like what they think might be complete, but isn't anywhere near yeah. complete. It's like, get these well, DLCs. Yeah, well, you don't have the, like, horse banner for, like, this, like the Germanic tribe. <laughs> oh, and, God. <laughs> like, oh, my God. And that's, like, two bucks. And it's like, okay, I guess so. You could, you could download, like, period loot music to, to <laughs> play with it. It's like, oh, do you have the Germanic DLC? But you don't have the Germanic <laughs> loot music that goes with it. So that would be oh, a Oh, that's second. not even... You didn't pay two dollars oh, for these watch- three tracks that you get but for. Uh, you know, with Crusader King, some though, it's getting like, oh, close to being good. Yeah. So I think like one or two more DLCs and it'll be good. I'm just oh, waiting. No. That's, that's it. That's like Stellaris Syndrome, right? It's oh, like, geez. well, yeah, you know, one more DLC. This is the one. This is the one. Oh. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. It, this this is what's gonna fix it. I don't know. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this fix, one, because I, I want to play the dollar. Cons- what was that, Hunter? I don't think it's not about like DLC to fix something. I think they just like they keep coming out with good ideas for content. And like Jim said, this new one that they're coming out with for like Stellaris has got like this AI race that you can play as. Yeah, but yeah that's okay, not so, always the so case. So there's your there's your expansion. It's like a second card game, but it's all diplomacy or something. Because man, Stellaris <laughs> still doesn't have diplomacy. So. So maybe just like a straight up diplomacy card game in space, yeah. where there's also no combat, but it's all espionage and backstabbing and proxy wars. Right. Stellaris has diplomacy. Well, it, yeah, it? somewhat. Kind of. It's not what I want. That's that's for sure. Solar settlers I'm... colon the saboteurs. Ooh, <laughs> I'd pay for that. I'd pay for that expansion. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I gotta get to work on something. Eh? That's right. That's right. There's clearly not enough variety in the base game. <laughs> I just want something where where it's like, okay, there's an established universe that people don't. You know, it's it's not like okay, we all just started with one planet and then we're expanding out till we run into each other and then we decide who we're gonna fight and conquer and whatever. But more like like the Dune universe where it's it's like there's a stable universe. And you're a person in it, right? But you're but you're trying to make gains in where you can. 
but it's you know it's not a thing of like okay i'm gonna raise an army and just kill everybody else or whatever so yeah. so it's kind of like you have to do it through diplomacy and then like the troops come out last right board game is you're stepping into one of the roles of those dune factions and they're all so different like and they have wildly crazy each have but you all have one so it's like you know any developers that are are you like, talking about the Avalon Hill games that could make something like that for me? Sorry, pardon me. <laughs> I said, do you know any developers that are inspired by board games that could make something like that? Do you know one? <laughs> All right, well, get on that. I'll see you in about okay, ten I'll minutes get on. when it's done. Uh, Spaz, I'd love. I would love to make a multiplayer. Yeah, I was just asking. I would love to make a the, the Avalon Hill uh, Dune version you were referencing there, or one of the other versions of Dune. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, the the out of print, really hard to find guy. Yeah, my brother has a copy still. <laughs> I wonder if it's on tabletop simulator or somebody I, needs to get on that. I think it is. Question mark. I'm not sure. <laughs> it probably is, but it's not legit. Sure. Yeah. I just Surely someone read the rules. I'll probably never play it, but I'm very in, intrigued with how they made a game out of it that can actually be interesting yet not predetermined. Yeah, I, I would love to make a multiplayer bring game. It's just about a cost effective way, both like in terms of development time and then also like for servers or, or yeah. whatever. Well it's, well, it's almost like uh, Hot Seat would be the way, because then you don't have to worry about net code. That's and all true. That crap, That's but... true. Yeah. Or yeah, it could perhaps, be else, yeah. perhaps uh, a reboot of Sins of Assault, or not Sins of Assault, Empire, uh, Empire of the Fading Suns. Goodness. Yeah. Emperor of the Fading Sons. Yeah, which is essentially Dune, kind of, in a in a not Dune-y universe. I don't know. Let's call it the Duneiverse. If you if you like <laughs> that game, you should definitely pick up the role playing books, because they're yeah. a fantastic read. Seriously. For Dune, okay, I had no. I had I'm of... Fading Sons. Fading Sons. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's a it's a shame that Noble Armada never made it. Oh. I remember the name because I lost it for it so bad. I, I played the demo at E3. The was demo was nine. great. Y'all. The demo was so great. It was kind of like Battlefleet Gothic, way ahead of its time. But good. I mean, yes. <laughs> sorry. Well, really, I mean that game. That game is like if you if you had a weird marriage of Warhammer Forty Thousand and Dune, you kind of get Fading Suns, somewhat. And with a smidge of uh, the Battletech universe thrown in there with the the house politics. Mm. Yeah, that's true. You know that that would be oh man, what a cool Stellaris mod because they did like Star Trek and stuff. A Battletech Stellaris mod that just sets up the great houses. In there I don't know anything about the, the succession war. I don't know anything about the spaceships in Battletech like at all. Like, are there spaceships? The space ship, yeah, there's, 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 yes, there's, there are. Oh, there's hell jump yes. ships yeah. and drop ships. Jump ships are basically, it, it's like a, a a big metal cigar that has a giant solar sail on the back, and they're very fragile, so they don't engage in combat with that at all. They even and made it illegal they, in they, the universe to attack one. Yeah, because of the, how rare they are. Right. So, so it's it's like. Not Dune style guild highliner, but it's still like the forbidden, like you don't attack those, right? But you can shoot the hell out of drop ships though. So the so it's basically like the jump ship comes in and it's got drop ships hanging off the outside, and then the drop ships fall down to the planet and then drop the mechs off. Or they get into like uh just getting into the atmosphere and the mechs jump out. And uh, it, very much like Starship Troopers is where it's inspired from. So the the mech has like a capsule that it crashes in and then it climbs out. Um, also a very 40k thing because that's how they deploy space marines. But yeah. Huh. Um, but the thing is, you could do the whole succession war and you never need a, a mech because, well, your armies, right, could be mechs, but you don't fight ground combat. Uh, it'll, it'll probably be a couple years before <laughs> before that DLC comes out. Uh, yes, but I don't know. I mean, it, it would be neat. I mean, the, the whole the Succession War thing was 
obviously very heavily Dune inspired, uh, but it's its own animal too. I, I liked it. It, it. It's basically like they fought and fought and they fought to the point where they had basically lost the ability to make high technology stuff. So, so it's like, we got what we got and all the factories are destroyed and the knowledge is lost and whatever. So, so at that point, it's like you have a battle mech that's like family legacy. It's passed from father to son and don't lose that in combat. Right. Cause it's like a knight and, uh, yeah. So, so Passing it's like family armor. Yeah. Yeah. So Literally. the mech warriors are, are basically like royalty yeah, kind of guys. They're, they're the knights of the battlefield, which is why you don't risk your mechs because you couldn't make new ones back then. And mm. then the, the time went on and it got away from that. And then they brought the clans in and the, and that's when the whole universe went to shit. And so, then everybody and their brother had a mech. Yeah. And then it's just they like, brought the factories back. Yeah. Hmm. So, um, the, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, no, I was, I'll, I'll let the battle tech thing go. But yeah, I was just uh, gonna Stellaris mod, please. Never, never let it somebody. go. <laughs> I was just gonna get back to Solar Settlers. So you said there's another uh, race coming. What else, uh, if anything, do you have planned uh, on the uh, or cooking for this game? I have a huge big list of uh, little features and uh, bu- small bugs and stuff that I've been meaning to get to for a while. Um, and then also I want to add a, a, a whack of new cards. So some new cards and then a new race. Uh, and then just a whole bunch of quality of life things that people have been suggesting. There's tons of great suggestions on the steam forums and stuff. Um, uh, I learned a lot from just the community in terms of what they like. Um, possible. Did this do, I don't remember. Did this do early access at all or did it just go straight to release? Uh, just straight to release. However, I have been like flirting with the idea of doing early access. I think it kind of makes sense for the kind of thing that I'm doing. Yeah, that. I, uh, <laughs> it's also kind of old school to just go straight to release uh, instead of doing early access. True. It feels like these days. Um, there are definitely benefits to it, but uh, at least with this, I think one, you get a little bit. I think you get a little bit more understanding in terms of like bugs or. Um, that might not quite be up to snuff or whatever. I think people have a little bit more leeway with that stuff in early access. So this game's very much like a player versus environment, right? So it's it's not like, well, you're playing against an opponent that's playing the same game as you. Correct, it's... yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not a huge fan of um, playing against AI generally in games. Uh, so all the Ringa games, it's like very asymmetrical. It's like the enemies are just playing a completely different game than you are. Um, so the, is it like a cinematic enemy? It's it's just like you whip them up when they're needed, and you know right. it doesn't yeah, matter exactly. what they were doing before, but they're here now. And I feel, yeah. or I feel, it's, yeah, I feel like with this game, or you're, you're just competing you're, against the systems, kind of. I was gonna say, I feel like in this game, you're your own worst enemy. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Like, oh no, I shouldn't. You run into hydrogen I, or oxygen. I, I shouldn't have moved that guy there. Oh no, I gotta kill that guy now. Oh, yeah, I ran out of oxygen. Yeah, yeah. It's so sad when you have to kill a guy. You know? It's so sad. Like they don't have names or faces or anything, but when you have to kill a guy and you just see them fly off the screen, it's like, oh, <laughs> it's just it feels so bad. I couldn't decide quite how hard to. Yeah, there, there's a few people have told me that I should have softened that a bit more, and a few people have told me that I should have like hit on it a little harder. I don't know. It was hard to decide just how savage to be about. Like, <laughs> like it's it's already. Sometimes you need to. Do. Sometimes you absolutely need to in order to succeed. You've got to make a move that you know is going to get you a resource you'll need next turn, but it's going to end up losing you at least one of your people. Yeah. So I, I mean, think I think you need you to, have to do that. you have to tap the XCOM vibe, right? Where let people name the little dudes yeah. after their friends, and then weep when they have to kill off somebody. <laughs> Oh, I'll never play this if you can that do that. Super I'll intense. never well, play then again, this. Again, when you colonize, you lose the you lose the uh, the person you sent. I mean, you you don't have access to them anymore, so they're alive. But you but don't they're have access safe in their little dome. They're not dead. They're <laughs> safe in their little dome, and they're it's their new home. They settled. Their solar settled. Oh my god, I've settled. Got it. I've got it. Cannibalism. Yeah, that's that's yeah. what we need. We need space cannibalism. No, we DLC. do not. This is, Tharsis, man. this is not Tharsis. I know, but there, but every space game, you should be able to like eat your coworkers because 
space. Could be a good card idea, man. Cannibal World. Yeah, there you yeah. go. There was even a Star Trek fan project that was about cannibalism, actually. What? Yes. It was uh, It was one of those Star Trek fan film things where um, they... It, it was some alternate universe deal where the ship like rescued somebody and then she was telling the story about uh, whenever she was a little girl and their the family was they were like on some they were gonna go colonize something but the the ship broke down or something and then it was like well mom and dad died and she was the only survivor on the ship and was starving to death so she had to eat her mom and dad while she waited on rescue oh my god uh, it was pretty dark actually it was, oh my it god. was like dark track. pretty dark <laughs> holy is this deep space oh my god is that what this is <laughs> holy shit <sighs> but yeah that's it so basically you can just kill somebody to turn them into dice that would be the way dice are oh. pretty sick Oh no! <laughs> please don't do that. Please, <laughs> please don't do that. It's I feel bad enough when one of these guys suffocates, you know. Yeah. Yep. Or, or motive. <laughs> well, it's like it's like when you leave uh, Alpha Centauri, and it's like, please don't go. <laughs> the drones need you. Or, oh or like, god! It's like, yeah. oh, I don't know. I don't need to go to school today, maybe. <laughs> or like motivational executions. It's like you shoot one guy in the head, and everybody else gets to re-roll one dice. That's awesome. That's super thematic. Oh man! So, uh, what do you have planned next? Like, what's your next game? Can you yeah. tell us about it? Starting it up a little bit. Uh, uh, I'm doing the solar update this week, and then next week I'm hoping to start a prototype for the next thing. Um, and believe it or not, uh, I think it's gonna be like a a game based on like lawn mowing, but with robot lawn mowers in space. Wait, like wait. So like Roomba lawn mowers? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, kind of like that. So then it'll it'll like, but they'll have like little rules for them. So it'll be like, once this hits a all or a stomp or something, it'll turn right, or it'll this will do U turn, or this will stop and wait until the cat leaves the path or something, or whatever. Yeah. So you'll have like a whole fleet of these like robo mowers that you set up and try to like efficiently mow the lawn. <laughs> and is the goal to mow the entire lawn in like a certain amount of turns? That's something like that. Or, or, or at least like a percentage of it, because I'm not sure that it's super fun to like get the last few. Oh yeah, you got that one square in the corner that you can't get to, and you're like, fuck. Yeah, so it might be like seventy percent or eighty percent or whatever, or it could scale with the ranks or something like that. So oh, God. It's not fully is, fleshed out yet, but what is that game? I can't think of the name of it. Uh, where you use a text console and you're controlling the little Roomba probes. Oh, uh, on Duskers? Yeah, Duskers. So that's it. It's it's like Duskers, the lawnmower version. Kind of like Mo that. Mowers? <laughs> so, so, dude, right. you, 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 you have to, man. In an homage to Duskers, it, you have to have a text interface. <laughs> that's how you control sure the mowers. Sure text. The mowers you, will be named like Lucy or... Yes. Diana or yeah. whatever. <laughs> yes. But, you, but you, you program them like, uh, remember big tracks? From, oh yeah, from, with the uh, with the like keypad in the day with the keypad Which, in the back. Yeah, you're like you're like right twenty five forward fifty. <laughs> oh god. Oh man. No, yeah. but well, what about what about as a as a programming game though? Uh, if you if you had to program AI for the lawnmower. Yeah, that sounds. Yeah, exactly. And That's it, kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, That's yeah, but, like, but, but what okay. about card-based AI? So, so it's like the AI is cards that you lay down, and it's going to process the cards and see. Yeah, totally. So you'd have like a, this stops on obstacles, or this turns right, or or this goes ten steps and then does this, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And you and you could actually build puzzles with that because you got to deal with the cards that are on this level. So you might not have a right turn. Right. So three lefts. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Sounds cool. Yeah. Uh, what Spaz? What was that game? There, there was some robot game where you actually programmed the robots like five moves at a time or something, and uh, it was a board game. Um, I it was like Robo Rumble about, or something. Well, uh, Robo Rally might be the one. Robo Rally. Playing. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I've played that one too. Yeah. 
Never heard of these games. <laughs> I'm glad we have some people here that have played uh, board well, games. Cause... Loads of board games? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. especially. Oh, my gosh. Can, can one of you guys explain how Robo Rally works? Because I vaguely remember it. Yeah, so basically you have a hand of cards, uh, and you have your little robot on the on the grid, and there's a... And on the grid, there's a whole bunch of treadmills and whatever, whatever else, things that turn your robot right and all this kind of thing. And you have a goal that you need to get to. And then you slot your five cards in your hand, which might be like move forward, move forward three, move forward, then turn right, turn right, you turn or whatever. And you have to slot them in, the, in an order that'll allow your robot to move where you want it to go. Okay. But the problem is you and all your friends reveal your time. So... And it is is there combat to it as well? Like you shoot each other. There's a at the, end of, at the end of the round, everybody shoots their lasers. So and inevitably, your plans will get screwed up immediately because somebody walked in in the way of you or whatever, and then you uh you'll end up shooting them with your laser or whatever. Like yeah, a, a contemporary uh, I, I wouldn't say remake because it's not really a remake, but it's in the same vein with some mechanical changes would be Colt Express. Yeah. And in that, uh, you each play a bandit trying to rob a train. And you you program your cards in the same way, but as you're programming cards, sometimes your cards have to be played face up. Sometimes they get played face down. And then you the at the end of everybody playing the cards they're going to play, the deck gets flipped over, and then each card gets resolved one at a time so you might have programmed it you move across the top of the train three spaces to the right and then on your next card might be to shoot diagonally downward and the person that you were hoping to shoot won't be there because they moved in the opposite direction or they moved onto your space and then fired or they moved the sheriff onto you which causes something bad to happen to you it's all sorts of fun stuff that can happen but it's in the same vein as Rubbo Rally. Yeah, I can yeah. think of a, I can think of like a lot of ways that you could make a really abusive, like you must commit to X number of moves ahead card game. That did 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 you ever play? Um, there was an old well, it was on PC too, but I played it on Commodore sixty four. But it was a programming game called Omega. Uh, Origin made it. Oh yeah, the tank yeah, game. It, yeah, the tank thing, dude. You could totally do Omega with cards and make it competitive. And what would be awesome would be that it, you wouldn't have to do the network crap because I could upload my tank and have it compete against other people, right? Like on the server or something, and then you'd get the replay back. But but it would just basically be like, uh, here here's the cards that I've got in the order that I put them in. Let's see how that fares against what you did. Sound like a really good... I, I think, yeah. I I didn't I'm play incorporate it at the time. that into my. I didn't well, I mean, it, it, the the one that the Omega the that came out from Origin was like a hardcore programming game. I mean, it it was like uh, there was a game that was called C plus plus Robots, and it's very similar. Um, yeah, that, that's pretty hardcore programming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, and on Steam right now, there's uh there's a thing called Screeps. And it's an RTS game, but you program the AI for all your little dudes. And uh, but the the I, I thought about it. I was like, oh man, that'd be because it because it all runs in Java, right? So it's like, man, I could like drag myself into learning Java and make it fun. The problem is though that it's like, okay, you buy the game for fifteen bucks, but then you actually have to buy like execution cycles in their cloud stuff for your dudes after that. So it's like the the more crazy AI you write, the more cycles it's going to eat, so therefore it costs you more to play the game. So it's kind of like, eh, I don't know. But you can continue to play forever, but you only get, like, you don't get, like, symmetric multiprocessing. It's like you get one guy gets one thought at a time kind of thing or something. It's very restricted, but I'm sure that most people are playing it that way instead of, but it, but it's it's like subscribe to win, right? But it, but it's interesting because it's it's like playing Dwarf Fortress, except I wrote the AI for all my little dwarf guys that are running around. There's something super satisfying about setting up a big machine or system or fortress of dwarves or whatever, and then just watching them do awesome things. And you're like, yes, yeah. my plans are so sick. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, have, have you played uh, um, since since we're talking about that that kind of stuff? Uh, RimWorld, any? I haven't not yet, but it's on my list. Oh yeah, it's oh god, it's good. And the the mods that people are putting it's out mean. is just crazy. It's mean. Did, it's a very have you seen mean the Cthulhu game. mod? You can run a cult, and then you, you're like what? summoning elder gods. Yeah, the, the, I was watching a guy play it on Twitch, and he he like took one of the colonists and like they build an altar right so he took the guy in and did like a human sacrifice and they used that to like summon a shogoth and then the shogoth is like just running around with the rest of the people and they they encountered like some colony of bugs that they had to fight so it was like well send the shogoth in and then shut the door behind it and you're kind of hands off control of a lot of things in that game it's just kind of like you try to nudge it in a direction, but the AI is going to do what the AI is going to do. And so he shoves the Shogoth in there and the Shogoth like just laid down next to the bug mound and went to sleep. (laughs) It was just like, I'm not fighting. (laughs) So yeah, it was, it was a temperamental thing, but it was hilarious watching the guys just frustration. Like after he went through all that BS and had to sacrifice one of the colonists to do it. And then the thing just goes in there and like, curls up with the enemy and goes to sleep. That sounds... But yeah, that game's what? ridiculous and mean <laughs> as shit because, because it's just like, if I just play it vanilla, it's trying to kill me. And I, I put a couple of mods on and now I die even more. But but it's I keep waiting on somebody to make a, a graphical front end for Dwarf Fortress like that because I, I've tried and tried to play Dwarf Fortress. I just keep bouncing off because I, I can't interpret all the ASCII bar fall over my screen. Barrier. And the other thing is uh, for me, I really like it when a game gives me clear goals that I want to, that, that I'm supposed to pursue. Yeah. And I find it really hard to like like, hey, do whatever you want. And it's like, well, <laughs> I, I really like it when I have a little bit more direction, and Dwarf Fortress doesn't really give you a lot of that. Uh, yeah, that's true. Does it's it's you, sort of a survival. Does it give thing. you any? Does it give you any direction? Like I tried to play it once, and my brain just noped out. Uh, well, like direction, generally, you're Don't trying die. to dig and not die, um, but it's kind of vague. It's very, it's very much experimental. It, right. It's just like how many iterations, you know, it's like, well, let's try doing this. Let's try doing that. And, and the, the glory of the game is actually about losing because every time you lose and you get a little bit smarter, your next, your next death will be more spectacular. Yeah. Because it's, it's like you set up this elaborate house of cards and then it falls down. Like at least if it would say like, Hey, like you got deeper than last time or something or yeah, I don't know. It was like the first time I ever made any kind of progress in it. And I thought, well, I want to settle next to water, right? Because dwarves, you know, people got to drink, right? So I want a fresh water source. So I settled like near a stream. And apparently that means that the, that the, there can be an aqua fire that they called it in the, in the ground. Right. So I dug down and I basically like hit an underground stream, but the underground stream was higher than the innards of my fortress. So just, instant flood apocalypse pow everybody's dead <laughs> it's just like oh shit yeah, it was like just water like rocketing out the front door and carrying dwarves out with it <laughs> so it's like well we all died and i i don't think i've been back since so but i keep waiting on something to to make it like approachable so that i can deal my wife was huge into nomoria she got nomoria up to the point where her computer was just choking because just processing turns, it was like she's got a million little gnomes running around. Wait, it's called No More Ria? Yes. Yeah, it's gnomes and Moria, like from the oh, other rings. Oh, I thought no it was Moria. No More Ria. Like, no more. Oh, no. Like, oh. No, like gnome. Oh. Gnome, gnome on the range. Oh, God. Oh man, there, God, uh, where that comes from? There, there was a con that I went to in 1983, and there was a guy that ran a game of Rollmaster, 
and we played as gnomes and that's what it was called it was called gnome gnome on the range and it was a competitive gnome <laughs> campaign it went on the better part of a day but it was it was cutthroat gnome rpg stuff tabletop i actually own no moria and i've owned it since 2015 and i've never played it such is the curse of the modern gamer <laughs> well, don't wait till it's finished to play it because that'll never happen but uh we are spoiled for choice we really yeah. are we know the one that i keep messing with is uh stone hearth that it's still actively in development but that's the closest thing to an approachable dwarf fortress that I've seen yet. Like I do like that bucks. one. I do like that yeah. one. Yeah, I do like that one a lot. Yeah. So, sure so everything we say about that game is basically dwarf fortress, but super simplified. Yeah. So someone like even like me can play it. Uh, so uh, I think I've co- we've covered just about everything. Do you guys have any more questions? Should we start wrapping this up? Let's start wrapping this up. Um. <laughs> Because I know Silence nothing of. I'm sorry, no. I know nothing of board games. I really like this game, though. I'm just gonna say I really <laughs> like this game. I I don't know how many games I play the 20, 30 because they play so fast. Uh, but folks, the game is Solar Settlers. It is ten dollars, and for ten dollars, you get just an obscene amount of gameplay. Seriously, there is just so. Like, if you look at the video, like it's just he's just putting cards down. No, there's a lot more going on than just putting cards and moving. Moving little uh, green dudes around. Seriously. Every choice matters. Every, every cho- choice every matters. Every choice. From everything you place down to what cards you're going to sacrifice for for just that one resource you need to, to you know, get another colonist going or have, an, have just one more point of oxygen so you're not suffocating it. it all of these things matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's very... It's very emergent, and it's it's really, really great. Uh, I've had a lot of fun with it, and you probably will, too. I'm about to buy Skyboats, because I definitely want to check that one out. Because uh, I, I love the f- thought of flying boats. Uh, <laughs> that one looks really cool. Uh, but, Brett, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, talk to us today. You me on. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, and uh, if you make another space game, which I hope you do, Definitely let us know because uh, we will definitely play it. Solar Settlers has been pretty successful so far, so there, there's a good chance I might. Like people love space. I I don't fully understand why space games died for ten plus years. Well, I kind of understand it, but people love space. I don't fully get you know. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> folks, just a couple of programming notes before we uh, end for the night. Uh, Thursday, we are after, it's been a couple of months now we haven't played Borderlands 2 because of time off and technical things. So uh, we're finally returning to Borderlands 2 on Thursday. Uh, That'll be fun. Uh, And then uh, next week for the podcast, we're doing another early morning show to talk to the developer of the FTL-like game Galactic Crew. Uh, which is looking pretty great, even though I tried playing it the other day and had a crash 10 minutes into the tutorial, or maybe five minutes. I don't know. It was real quick into the tutorial that it crashed. So I'm like, eh, damn it. Um, so that's an early morning show because our guest is overseas. I forget where. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, a couple things. Uh, this Sunday, I forgot to mention, is our last Earth and Beyond uh, monthly uh, MMO meetup. Um, so that's going to be fun. And then, uh, for the final three months of the year, we're going to be doing star Wars galaxies and apparently, hey. apparently, uh, not using the emulator. We're doing the other one now. Apparently we're going to, uh, we'll, 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 we'll figure it out. There's, there's yeah. something we got to sh- talk about. We should do some testing and some talking. Uh, but yeah, definitely star Wars galaxies on the table for the last few, three months of the year. Uh, for our monthly MMO meetup. But this this month is Earth and Beyond, which you can play for free. Uh, there are details on how to do that on the Steam forums. Um, and then uh, next Saturday, the 30th, uh, we're going to be doing a special weekend thing with the developers of EVE Online Valkyrie. Uh, well, it's just EVE Valkyrie. Not EVE oh, Online it's just Valkyrie. EVE Valkyrie? I'm sorry. Yes. 
Eve Valkyrie. Uh, that's the 30th, uh, 7 a.m. our time. That's going to be fun. Uh, we're going to be doing some streaming with those guys. Uh, I've never played that game, and hopefully moving away from VR will get them a bigger player base. <laughs> hopefully. I, well, no, it's got, it got me a, intrigued. Well, yeah. that's a thing, right? Because I look at so many games that are on Steam, mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, well, if that wasn't locked down to VR, yeah, I would totally buy that. Exactly. And so many of these games just don't require VR. It's just like... Well, I, you know, I just made it for VR, but you could just turn the damn VR off and, and it would be fine. So, you know, especially if it already plays with a gamepad or mouse and keyboard just happens to be VR. Yeah, I really appreciate uh, game. Zone. I'm looking at you. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate <laughs> yeah. games that support both. Uh, about the new, the, that new VR battle zone doesn't though, right? That's just, nope. damn it. And, and such a, such a damn mess, it. right? Because man. That would be cool. Uh, eventually, maybe it will. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I've seen... Well, you know what my current giant burn is? Is that I had always wanted, like, when are they going to convert war robots from Android over to PC? Please. I would I would really like to play that on PC. Uh, and they just, they just won't. So now they have it on PC... <laughs> They have it on PC, but VR only. What's it called? And it's just like mm, War Robots. Never heard of Steam. it. Yeah, it's a oh look. Well, you got an Android tablet. Uh, I think it's called Walking War Robots or just War Robots. Yeah, he. I uh, just like in, uh, in stream chat. Yeah, take that freaking VR off the end of it, and you got me. Oh, that looks great, but, and that's VR. Yeah. Oh, son of a gun. Donkulous. Okay, so you know what the cure is? Is we need a fake VR. <laughs> <laughs> an app that fakes an Oculus and then just bakes it down to one screen. <laughs> and then we can play it without, you know, I can play it with my, my head tracker or whatever. Oh, man. But, yes. uh, oh, there, and there there's that Solar Settlers game. I heard it was all right. Well, and, and don't feel... Don't don't be too upset because no one's playing that battle zone game. Like I think two people are playing it right now, and that's it. So don't just do VR, people. Please, please don't do just VR. You're just shooting yourself in the foot. Or if you just... do do VR, send everybody an Oculus. <laughs> something. Anyway, let's wrap this up. Brett, thank you so much for hanging out tonight. It was fun. Uh, again, the game is Solar Settlers. It's awesome. Even if you don't like card games, and I typically don't, this is a great game. It's only $10. If you love board games, if you love you board games even better. But even if you don't love board games, this is a great game. Seriously, it's fantastic. Uh, so thanks for watching and listening, everyone, and we will see you later. Have a good night, y'all. Bye-bye.